Let's see. Can we get going here? Stephen, we're live. Okay. Well, I don't have anything to show me that. So. I think your rocket chat might not be updating. Right. Um, okay, well, welcome to everybody. Uh, this is a little bit difficult because I can't tell what anybody is saying, but um, uh, we were signed up to do a Q&A about the current state of our physics project, which I'm looking forward to. But let me see if I can get this so that I can actually find out what questions people are asking, which I can't currently see. Um, so let me take a look here. Uh, do you want me to relay questions into Zoom chat? Um, uh, yeah, I think, well, hold on. Let me just, I think I can solve this. Let me just try restarting something here. Ah, okay, that worked. Good. All right. Um, let's see, there's a question here about have I got feedback from physicists such as Gerhard, Ed Hoft, Ed Fredkin, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, I have uh, essentially all these people, we, I've been exchanging email with lots of physicists. I have to say, uh, there are a few where I'm a little concerned because I haven't heard back from them and I'm getting worried that they're okay. Um, and mostly I've, I've uh, heard back from a lot of people um, of things like, wow, this looks interesting, let me look at it. And um, uh, I would say that the, the, um, uh, the younger crowd, we're getting more of, I wanna work on this. I wanna come to your summer school. I wanna really do things. Um, the older crowd, and I'm, I'm one of the older crowd, so I'm, I'm allowed to say the older crowd here, um, is uh, uh, more of the, hey, looks interesting. Let me look at it. Um, and actually, I need to, um, I need to send some follow-up email to a bunch of people because I'm really hoping we'll be able to do some discussions on these live streams with some of uh, uh, your favorite physics types. Um, you know, as people may realize, it, it's a strange time warp situation for me because I was very active in physics in the late 1970s and early 1980s when um, uh, the people that uh, you folks were mentioning here um, were in their kind of... Um, uh, sort of early to mid careers. And of course now, you know, 40 years have gone by. Um, and uh, so people are, uh, many of those people are at much later stages in their careers. Um, and, uh, but, um, and there's sort of a, a new guard of people who are uh, energetically working on physics. And um, I would say that uh, we've got a lot of enthusiasm there. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, it, it, it um, you know, it was funny, I, I, um, I had sent out, I think I mentioned this in the uh, blog post that I put out yesterday, I had sent out um, in my first sort of round of, hey, this is something we're doing um, type messages. I had, um, I had sent out, um, uh, sent this out to quite a few people I know, um, including some historians of science who've been interested in um, kind of uh, uh, sort of understanding uh, well, particularly things like the phenomenon of, of um, the, the uh, sort of the trend towards computation as a foundation for thinking about science as opposed to mathematics as a foundation for thinking about science, something I've been sort of deeply involved in. So uh, some of my uh, uh, contacts in history of science have been, have been studying that. But anyway, I sent, uh, I sent the original announcement to a bunch of people and I, I quoted actually in this blog post something from a, uh, from a friend of mine who's a uh, longtime historian of science. I'll, I'll read it to you because I think it's kind of interesting. Um, it says, please remember that as you go forward, please remember as you go forward that many protestations to the contrary, most scientists hate originality, which feels strange, uncomfortable, and baffling. They like novelty well within the boundaries of what they're doing and the approach that they're taking, but originality is harder for them to grasp. Therefore, expect opposition based on incomprehension rather than reasoned disagreement. Hold fast. Now, actually, I think my friend there has been more pessimistic than appears justified right now. So, because I think we're we're seeing um, uh, um, 
better absorption than um, uh, than that might predict. But um, yeah, it's um, I'm, I'm hoping we'd be interested to know um, uh, people who people would think it would be particularly interesting for us to have discussions with on these live streams. I think the uh, the form of these discussions will mostly be our attempt to understand some uh, existing area of, of physics development or mathematical development um, and uh, trying to see how that relates to the things that we've done. And particularly interesting things like twister theory, spin networks, um, lots of kinds of things. Um, Okay, somebody's asking here about David Deutsch's constructor theory. Uh, David has been a longtime friend of mine. Um, and uh, um, he, like many of the other people, people have been mentioning here, uh, sent back a piece of mail saying, this looks interesting, I need to study it. Um, and uh, uh, um, I don't know enough about David's constructor theory to really be able to comment on that. I mean, the idea, as David has explained it to me, is to sort of be more realistic about the physicalization of quantum processes rather than thinking about them as purely sort of quantum information things to be more realistic about where the atom has to go and so on. And I think it's a, a definite possibility that there are relations and I'd like to understand that better. Um, I don't know whether, Jonathan, have you looked at, at David Deutsch's constructor theory stuff? Yeah, yeah, and I, I think it's I think it has a reasonably nice interpretation in the context of our formalism. So, um, so David's notion of constructor theory is that um, instead of it, it's kind of a, it's a new conception of of express or a new methodology for expressing laws in fundamental physics. So rather than saying laws of physics are expressed in terms of um, you know laws of motion that tell you how to go from initial states to final states, you express laws of physics in terms of statements about what classes of transformations can and cannot be made to occur. So it's kind of a, it's a more directly computational way of expressing laws of fundamental physics. So our notion that laws of physics are basically ultimately uh, defined in terms of hypergraph transformations is sort of the ultimately desiccated version of that idea. So it, in fact, I, I rather suspect that, effect, that something like constructor theory is the natural way of specifying kind of um, effective theories in the context of our models, right? When you have you have an effective theory that's that uh, that is that consists of a bunch of different hypergraph transformations, we can make definitive statements about what large scale classes of hypergraph transformations can and cannot happen, subject to those rules. Oh, and a, those statements are effectively statements of constructor theory. Oh, that's interesting. I mean, so so you know, the traditional approach in quantum mechanics and certainly in quantum field theory is it's kind of the S matrix story of there's a, an incoming state then something happens and there's an outgoing state. And you're saying that, that in the David Deutsch theory that it's more a, this is a configuration of the world and this is how it can be modified. Yes, yeah, exactly. So, so, yeah, it, 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 so at some level, you know, theoretical computer science tends to express things in terms of computability and non-computability and things like that. And uh, it seems a little bit different from how physics is normally formulated. And right. David's point has been that you can, you can do both with one language. Let's try and get David to, to join us on one of these live streams and we'll, we'll have a good discussion about that. Um, uh, somebody's asking about Lenny Susskind and I don't think I've heard from him. So I, you know, it's, it's such a strange time with this pandemic. And I have to say there are some people where um, uh, in the sort of physics crowd where I was like, I'm really surprised I haven't heard from them. And I sort of pushed harder and I found out that they have some terribly complex situation going on with this pandemic. And it's like, up, oh, okay, I'm not gonna hear from you. You know, it's your life is complicated, go deal with your life type thing. So it's a little bit, a little bit random on, on that um, in that regard. And I'm, I'm particularly, uh, I have to say, concerned about some of the older folk who are um, sort of on the list. We, we've heard from the vast majority of, of people, but, but some we have not. And I, I have to admit, I'm a little bit concerned and I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to poke harder. Um, let's see, uh, questions here coming in, lots of questions. Um, oh, there's a question here from a Garrick asking, what have been the most foundational books in my physics education? You know, unfortunately, the, answers to that, the answer to that question isn't as interesting as it might be because it was mostly 50 years ago. So the books that I sort of liked 50 years ago, people would say, oh, that's a really ancient thing. I mean, I... I, I liked, you know, Dick Feynman's lectures on physics, even from before I knew Dick Feynman. Um, although uh, I personally, the sort of first serious 
undergraduate physics books that I read was the, I think called the Berkeley Physics Course Series, which were quite good. And they, I don't know whether they even still exist. Um, the, uh, I mean, quite a lot of what's in these books is absolutely not out of date. Um, uh, you know, Misna Thorne and Wheeler's Gravitation book, that's a nice book. Um, I, I liked Steve Weinberg's book on gravitation and cosmology, even though Steve didn't bother to read my book uh, uh, very carefully when it came out. Um, and uh, although I think, I think maybe that's been corrected subsequently. Um, but uh, obviously I was reading his gravitation and cosmology book many years before, many, many years before that. Um, I would say, uh, you know, one of the things that happens with these, with these books is as fields get better understood, they sometimes get more clearly explained and sometimes they get less clearly explained in my observation. What do I mean by that? You know, sometimes one didn't know what was important. And so one had some whole formalism that has a lot of decoration of, you know, oh, there's an index i, j, zero, mu, nu, whatever. And it turns out it's always i, j, zero, mu, nu. And so you can make a new notation where it doesn't have all of that weird decoration. And, you know, and so sometimes people, you know, the notation becomes cleaner. It's kind of like good language design. And sometimes it becomes more complicated because people say, what about this special case? What about that special case? We have to be more generalized. And then it becomes, you know, much harder to, to sort of penetrate and get, and get an, an immediate understanding of. So, you know, I think in, in different areas of physics, like for example, in, in quantum field theory, it's my impression that some of the newer textbooks are cleaner than some of the older textbooks. I mean, I, you know, back in my day, there were books by people like Bjorkin and Drell, uh, a person called Chalane, Gasiorowicz. These are all people, you know, the funny thing is that, that, you know, I read these books when the names of the authors were just names. And then subsequently I got to know a bunch of these people. And so it kind of, uh, it sounds different when you say their names after you actually know the people. But you know, a lot of these books were kind of in the early period of, you know, they were written in the 1960s, maybe early 1970s. And they were at a time when sort of uh, some issues of quantum field theory were not well clarified. And I think some of the newer books are much cleaner in that regard. So, um, uh, you know, it's, it's um, um, the answer is that I, I would say that the books that I learned things from may have been made obsolete by the passage of time. Um, and uh, uh, so I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I, I will give a pitch, by the way, if you're just trying to understand the, the, the outline of how various areas in physics work. I, I have been proud of myself that the notes in the NKS book, in the New Kind of Science book that you can find online about areas of physics are, uh, uh, you know, as I've, as I've been rereading re them, as I'm trying to sort of remember how things work, they are, they're fairly non-formal but they are uh, quite incisive and short in terms of explaining what the main point of a bunch of these areas of physics is. And I, I would recommend them on the grounds that also you can read them in five minutes in many cases. Um, okay, so a question here about uh, what do the first week, two weeks of public science teach me? Well, it's really encouraging. I mean, people are really interested in this stuff. I didn't know, I honestly, didn't know how many people were going to care about questions about fundamental physics. And I would say that what's happened has greatly exceeded my expectations in a number of dimensions. Um, first, the speed with which people who are real experts in these fields, um, I would say particularly the younger ones, but not exclusively the younger ones, have started to really engage. Um, and second, I would say the, the sophistication of uh, conceptual understanding of a lot of people about what we're talking about. I mean, I would say that the, um, uh, you know, those are, those are two things that have been really good. Um, I would say that the other thing that is a, is a strange phenomenon is the number of people who send us mail saying, you know, I have a theory of physics too kind of thing. And it's a funny thing because, because it's, you know, maybe some of these theories and, and people have good ideas, it's hard to tell. It's very hard to tell because, you know, any, so any theory, so first point is that any sort of theory that doesn't connect with the kind of known formalisms of physics, like general relativity and quantum field theory, 
is at a huge disadvantage. You know, if you have to rebuild everything that's been understood from quantum field theory, you've got at least a century of building to do. And if you say, well, I'm, I'm giving a reformulation of these things in completely other terms, that's a very challenging thing for anybody to understand. I mean, I, I, I sort of pride myself on being pretty good at understanding new things, but it's a, it's a tall tower to climb to, to get to, um, to an understanding of something that's a very different formalism. I mean, I know, you know, the remarkable thing for me, a lot of what we're now doing in this physics project was in my new kind of science book. You know, the, the basic idea of the formalism was absolutely in there, including a bunch of specific results and so on. And yet, in 18 years, uh, very few people uh, were able to sort of climb that, that hill, that tower, so to speak, to get into that formalism. So when I see, you know, somebody sending in, and I've got a theory of physics too, it's like, you know, it's very hard to tell what's going on there. Um, and we're, we're really asking people, you know, if you think it's actually relevant to what we're doing, tell us in detail how, and tell us in our terms, because there's no way we're going to understand your terms. Um, so that's, I, I would say that the, um, uh, there are more theories of physics out there uh, from uh, kind of um, uh, sort of the amateur world than I, than I had thought. And, you know, in a sense, it's a, it's, I think quite a lot of these things are, are things that people have kind of written often as people write poetry or something where it's kind of like, it's fun to write, it's not clear anybody's going to read it. Um, and, uh, uh, and it's often quite, quite difficult to understand. But I would say that the, um, uh, the thing that we're starting to see here is in, in these live streams, when we do these more technical working session live streams, we're starting to see really helpful suggestions made by people. And I'm sure that will, that will uh, accelerate over time um, you know, we saw that uh, I've been doing live stream design reviews for Wolfram Language for quite a long time. And I would say that uh, uh, at the beginning, it was people were, were sort of enthusiastic and cheerful and making a few suggestions. But over time, they started making really good technical, uh, sort of incisive to the point suggestions. And I think we'll, we're, we are already seeing that uh, with these physics live streams, and I'm sure that will accelerate over time. Um, let's see. Ah. Uh, okay, so, so Calais is, is mentioning that um, uh, the idea of atoms seems to be quite um, uh, persistent. And it, yes, I mean, one of the things that is interesting about what we've done here um, is, you know, there's a certain kind of similarity between what we're doing and the very earliest ideas of how physics might work back from antiquity. I mean, of course, it's also informed by a lot of the technical formalism of what's come in between, but the idea, you know, there are sort of indivisible atomy-like things that are little elements that, you know, are related in certain ways. There's a certain kind of, it's kind of not sort of, it's kind of people have suspected things must work that way forever. And it is interesting to see these threads of history. Um, you know, people have been sending me actually a bunch of uh, things that Einstein wrote where he absolutely anticipated that, for example, space and time would turn out to be discrete, but he thought that the, the tools didn't exist in his time. He wrote about this multiple times. I mean, he was pretty sure that that's how things would turn out, um, but just didn't have the tools in that time. And there are there are, you know, always once one sees some sort of methodological progress in science, it's, it's almost always possible to go back and say there were precursors of this, you know, in the past. And, and sort of the shocking one for me is the, is the precursor in my own work where, you know, we got to a certain distance and, and then it just sort of never got followed up properly. Um, so, it, but it is interesting to see this idea of atoms that uh, has been around for a really long time. And, you know, we have a more abstracted version of that, but actually some of the, the ancient Greek versions were pretty abstracted too. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, there's a question here about Wolfram language. What, what language is Wolfram, is, is Wolfram language written in? Uh, increasingly and mostly these days, it's written in Wolfram language itself. Um, there's a small core that was originally written in a, a version of C 34 years ago now. Um, but increasingly, the, the system is written in the language itself. And there are, there are pieces of what we do that are in all sorts of other languages.
but um, the, the, the number one answer is it's written in the language itself. Um, let's see. Uh, it's a question from Josh here. How do you ensure your epistemology, concept of concepts, is not invading your ontology, concepts of reality, the way it has for current particle physics? Okay, that's an interesting question, and I need to take it apart now. Um, first of all, what, I mean, you know, what's happened in particle physics is, you know, up until about 1980, things were really, really crunching. I mean, things were really moving well. And, you know, the idea of gauge theories, spontaneous symmetry breaking, all these kinds of things, the idea of, you know, the beginning ideas of grand unified theories, all those kinds of things, it was going great. Um, it kind of ran into, well, it didn't run into a wall. It just ran out of steam because all the things that accelerators could see were seen and they kind of worked according to the way the model said they should work. And eventually the top quark was discovered. Eventually the Higgs particle was discovered and it kind of was all according to plan. And the attempts to sort of extend the plan and particularly to pull gravity into the picture just have been really difficult. And I think we can now see from what we're doing that there were some sort of structural problems with the kind of the foundations of what was being done, which prevented, uh, you know, probably some things being seen that could have otherwise been seen. Um, but, you know, so what instead happened was between supergravity and string theory and, uh, you know, some of these or particularly string theories were sort of the most popular uh, place where the particle physicists went, so to speak, if they didn't leave particle physics and go into quantum information or some quite different area. Um, but, you know, in, in string theory, it is first and foremost an interesting and elegant mathematical theory. Uh, does it have to do with physics? Well, I, it's hard to know. Um, is it going to be informative as a way to provide formalism that will be helpful for our kind of model? I think it's very likely it is. Um, now, you know, one can ask the question, did, you know, did it... Uh, you know, I think the implication of, of Josh's question here is, you know, what happened in particle physics was a bit of an untethering because there wasn't experimental input. Um, but, and instead what ended up happening was the building of this more and more elaborate mathematical theory. So here's the thing I would say. One of the things that we're starting from nothing. So our first mission is to reproduce what's already known in physics. String theory was sort of already starting by building in a lot of what was already known in physics. So it was kind of like, it's not surprising it comes out because you put it in. In some cases, you had to really stuff it very hard to get it to, to fit into string theory. But I think what we've got, the first, you know, the first step for us is, can we explain, you know, can we get the things that are the, the sort of uh, the pride of, you know, the beloved results of quantum field theory, general relativity, and so on. We're doing really well at this. It's going great. But we're not there yet. There's a whole, you know, everything that's in all the textbooks, we've got to be able to reproduce from nothing. We're not starting from that formalism and then saying, let's build up from that, which is kind of what string theory did. We're starting from nothing, and we have to get to what's already there. And for me, it's like people say, you know, well, what about sort of experimental validation of these theories? And, and that's something that hopefully will come. And I'm be really excited when we can start really suggesting uh, very concretely experiments for people to do. But the first step is, let's get the theoretical validation that we can get from nothing to the kinds of things that are in the textbooks of physics. And I think that's kind of the, um, uh, that's the sort of exciting thing. And, and when you get, you know, the big test of a theory, as far as I'm concerned, is what's the ratio of what you get out to what you put in? If what you get out is actually not much more than you put in, and what you're getting out, you kind of have to very carefully sculpt in order to not get the wrong things out. That's not a good sign for the theory as a big sort of uh, explanatory theory. When you put very little in and lots of stuff comes gushing out, that's a super good sign. And that's what I've been really excited about with what we've been doing is that's what's been happening. And, and so far, there have been no hacks. That is, there's been nothing where we run into it and we say, oh my gosh, the only way we can explain that the world is, is you know, three plus one dimensional instead of, instead of 26 dimensional or something is to put in something that looks like a hack. Now, having said that, there are things in the history of physics that I personally thought were hacks, uh, like the Higgs mechanism I thought was kind of a hack. Um, 
And I was sort of, uh, you know, I couldn't figure out anything better back when I was, was really working on this 40 years ago. But um, it was, uh, I was sort of a little disappointed when the Higgs particle was discovered and it, uh, you know, the hack is real, so to speak. But, but um, the fact is that in, in what we've been doing, there have been so far, it's really just been a question of can we, can we figure out the formalism well enough to get to the things that are known physics? It's not, oh, we have to put in a hack here to achieve that. Now, getting that formalism well enough worked out is something that can be greatly informed by a lot of work, I think, that's been done in traditional mathematical physics, whether it's string theory, loop quantum gravity, whatever else. I mean, I think that's one of the things, hopefully we'll be talking to some of the, the people who've created those fields um, in, uh, in some of these live streams and trying to understand what those, how to make those connections more concretely. Um, somebody's commenting on, can't believe Lenny Susskind hasn't been weighing in and I, I haven't, I, I'm pretty sure I haven't heard from Lenny, although I might be behind on my email and I, I hope he's okay. Um, okay, there's a question here. How long do you think it would take a real physicist to fully grasp everything in the project? A lowly undergraduate is the question. Well, okay, so I, we have some data points, okay? Because uh, uh, we've done, uh, a, well, actually only two so far, kind of high speed briefings about this project for groups of physicists. Uh, one was a bunch of uh, string theory black hole people, and another was some uh, internal physics physicists at our company. Um, and I would say that those were both, I don't know, probably three, four hour, um, I wouldn't call them extravaganzas, but high intensity descriptions of what was going on. And I would say that, that a, a certain number of people in both of those groups uh, really seem to get the big ideas. Now, in terms of understanding all the formalism and how everything works, works, I think that's more complicated. Um, but I would say that, uh, uh, you know, there's a, there's a, um, uh, we're seeing actually a, a, a sort of a, both in those two examples and in what, what I'm seeing from people sending us mail and so on, we're seeing people grasping kind of the big picture. Uh, 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 you know, so I, I would say it's a funny thing. It's, it's like a lot of these things. It's some fraction of people who know about physics will be able to grasp this easily and some other fraction, it just won't resonate particularly with their current way of thinking about things and it'll take a bit longer. Um, you know, for our summer school, we are planning, usually we have a three week summer school that concentrates on people doing sort of original projects. Um, this year, our summer school is virtual. So that's a, that's a change from the last 17 years. But the other change is that for the physics track that we're adding this year for the summer school, we're going to tack on a week zero at the beginning, which is going to be our attempt to provide kind of the material for physics types to be able to sort of get up to speed with, with what we're doing. Now, I would say, you know, how much physics do you need to know to be able to get up to speed efficiently? Um, I would say for the most efficiency, you need to have like taken a course in quantum field theory and a course in general relativity. Um, the, uh, is it possible without that? Of course. Um, it will be faster if you know those, those areas, um, at least if, even if you've taken just a sort of a first course in each of those areas. Um, I would say that... Uh, there's a lot to figure out about this project, which doesn't require going through quantum field theory and, and through general relativity. There are lots of questions about the, the underlying structure of hypergraphs and how that all works. Uh, many of those questions, I think, will be most informed by some fairly advanced mathematics, um, but I don't know. And it may very well be that there are a whole class of questions that can be addressed without uh, a big tower of, of Mathematics, and when I talk about mathematics, I'm talking about things from geometry, topology, algebraic topology, um, maybe a little bit of group theory, graph theory, things like that. Um, uh, a bunch of modern directions in mathematics are, are really, really relevant to the kinds of things that we are trying to do and the kinds of ways that we're taking limits of these um, hypergraphs and graph structures and so on is something very much in the line of what has been being developed in areas of mathematics like geometric group theory and so on over the last 25 years. Although Unfortunately, the mathematics hasn't really caught up with where we need it to be. Um, but I think, and it's really a really exciting thing as far as I'm concerned, that a bunch of the things we're doing should inform how that mathematics should work in a way that's happened several times in the last century 
in sort of the progress of physics and its sort of co-evolution with mathematics, but I think we've got a great opportunity there. Um, so uh, my answer is I'm hoping that the, the week zero of our summer school will be a good place for, for many physics types to get up to speed. Some things will be a bit faster um, uh, if you know more stuff about existing physics. Um, okay, so there's a question here about what areas of mathematics are you looking at for doing calculus with dimensions that vary over time? Is this a problem ever seen in mathematics before? Any clue where to start on this problem? Okay, I think the most plausible place is geometric group theory. So in geometric group theory, and I, I'm not sure that um, it's not the only possibility, but it's a place where a lot of modern work has been done. So the idea in geometric group theory is you have a group, which is a very discreetly defined thing with with you know, generators and relations, and you can make up words that are formed from discrete sequences of generators in the group, and different words are equivalent to each other and all those kinds of things. The map of equivalences is, well, the map of, of distinct words and how they relate to each other through generators is the Cayley graph of the group. And so a lot of work was done, particularly by, uh, sort of initiated by a person called Misha Gromov, um, who uh, back in the, in the 1980s and so on, um, looking at the limits of Cayley graphs as they get very, very big. And that's a very discrete kind of object. And the fact that one can look at those kinds of limits and make geometric statements about them is very much the same kind of thing that we have to do with our hypergraphs. And actually, in, um, uh, I talked to Misha Gromov um, several times in the 1990s when I was first working on kind of understanding the limits of, of graphs as manifolds and so on. And so there's, there's been a little bit of co-evolution there already. Um, but I think that's an area which is a, a very hot area of mathematics with quite well developed, well, becoming better developed, I think may be useful. I think one of the challenges is, okay, so I wrote about this a little bit in the technical introduction uh, that I wrote to our project. But um, one of the challenges is, what on earth does calculus look like in fractional dimensional space? And, um, uh, you know, a lot of what calculus is about is saying, let's use Euclidean space, you know, Rn, whatever, something we really understand well as the model for even wild things that happen in spaces. Let's, let's make manifolds where locally we can think of what's going on as being like a space that we're familiar with. So, one of the things that I think is, a, is an interesting uh, starting point is, what is the right model space for a fractional dimensional space? How do you start defining? We, we have limits that we can potentially define that represent a bunch of the concepts of calculus applied to our hypergraphs in various limits. But how do we really understand those limits? What is the, the existing mathematical object that can represent even sort of the basic version of those limits. I mean, we understand a lot of stuff about how, let's say, tangent spaces are built. You know, they're, they're built from equivalence classes of geodesics through points. We have a notion of geodesics. We can have some understanding of how that limit works. But it's, it's like, to me, that's the thing, is what is the space that should be used as a model for the local structure of one of our fractional dimensional limits? Um, I, I might be wrong in that direction, but that's what I think is the right place to go. And I think there's going to be a generalization of calculus, actually, that will work for these fractional dimensional things and where one will be able to start discussing dimension change. It's sort of hopeless to discuss dimension change when all you've got is dimension two, dimension three, dimension four. You know, you're not going to be able to get a calculus of dimension change if you are only dealing with those discrete dimensions. Um, and, you know, to what extent can sort of the whole fractal story play into this? not as convincingly as I might have hoped in my view. That is people have defined uh, you know, things on Cantor sets and so on. So a certain amount of calculus on Cantor sets, but it usually is, well, actually the thing is embedded in one or two dimensional space. And it's merely that there's a, there's a measure which is derived from the Cantor set, not that the actual space itself has some kind of uh, fractal character to it. Um, Let's see, question here. I'm a physical chemist. Want to apply your model to some sort of chemistry problem. Can I get by with only a little knowledge of graph theory? Um, yes, I, I think so. I mean, which part of graph theory you're gonna need, you don't have, it's hard to know. So, so for example, I can imagine that uh, chemical synthesis is an area 
not completely unlike what we're doing because you've got a molecule and it, you've got certain you know, rules that you can apply to change the graph structure of the molecule. And you ask, you know, can you get a molecule with another structure, those kinds of things. There are probably some things I've, I've long been interested in the question and maybe some chemist already knows the answer, but it's like you cook something up with long molecules, big molecules, big hydrocarbons, something like this. And you get some distribution of, of shapes and sizes of molecules all represented by graphs. What's the measure on the space of graphs that you get out? So you've you've got this thing, and it's a you know it's a big soup in one I don't know one of these whatever fractional distillation columns or something. I haven't thought about that since I was not learning chemistry in in, in uh, middle school or something. Um, but uh, uh, but but you know you you get out these these long molecules, and um, uh, the question is you can think about the distribution of molecules as a distribution of graphs. How do you, what is the way to think about that distribution of graphs? And how does that relate to, for example, well, in our current situation, multi-way systems represent the, can be thought of as representing the space of possible chemical, chemical transformations that are made. And actually it's an interesting idea. There are probably things that one could start to say about these sort of ensemble outputs of, you know, ensembles of graphs of chemicals. Now, what kind of graph theory do you need to know to do that? I don't know. And the fact that I don't know means going to learn graph theory is not necessarily going to be helpful because you have no idea, you know, graph theory is a fairly, fairly broad field. I would just start, I think there's a good chance that the graph theory you need to know is graph theory that you can essentially learn from the Wolfram language documentation when you actually start to try and try and do, do real computations. That would be my, I, I don't think there's a go read this particular graph theory book. Uh, to, to get started, I would just I would just start playing around with you know functions that we have for doing things with graphs and so on to get some feeling for it. Okay, let's see. There's a question here about trouble understanding how special relativity follows from a theory. Trying to follow the reasoning in Jonathan's paper, I think he embeds a causal graph on Lorentzian lattice. Um, However, for me, it seems this is a logical result of the fact that you start with a Lorentzian metric. No, we're really not starting from a Lorentzian metric. I don't know, Jonathan, since this is addressed at your paper, which uh, uh, I could say you know infinitely better than I do, um, do, you want to, do you want to try taking this one? Sure, sure, yeah. So th this is a, actually, the fact that I've now seen this question asked by two people apparently independently indicates maybe I need to rephrase some things because uh, th th there's clearly something that isn't sufficiently clarified. So um, the point is, I mean, th this, the special relativity derivation sort of qualitatively doesn't differ from the derivation that Stephen gave back in, uh, in NKS, right? The, the idea is effectively, um, you know, we have this notion of causal invariance. We have this notion that um, independent of the order in which you apply the update rules, the causal networks that you get out are all isomorphic as directed acyclic graphs. So um, as you know, there are these two fundamental postulates of special relativity, and effectively everything else in special relativity follows as theorems from those two postulates. The first is the constancy of the speed of light. Now that holds axiomatically in our model because every causal edge we assume to have you know, uh, equal, equal length, which implies that the, speed, that the maximum rate of information propagation is fixed. Um, and then the second postulate is what's called Lorentz symmetry, which is the statement that um, even though it, orderings of space-like separated events in space-time can vary depending on the observer, vary depending on the uh, choice of inertial frame, the ordering of time-like separated events, events that are that are causally related, is always uh, invariant. Well, that's exactly the statement of causal invariance, right? Because in the causal network, every pair of events that are that, of, of updating events that are separated by a directed edge are, are taken again axiomatically to be time like separated so the statement that the that the causal graph is always isomorphic is exactly the statement that the time like ordering is is preserved even when the space like ordering is not the reason i did the whole embedding into the into the lorentzian uh, lattice into this minkowski lattice in the paper was to show explicit i mean okay let me just say I could have ended it there. I could have just said, you know, causal invariance is just the statement of Lorentz symmetry, and I could have stopped there. What I was trying to do was show the, the precise reasoning that, that, that uh, allows you to, to see that that notion is equivalent with the notion of Lorentz, in, of Lorentz symmetry that you study in ordinary conventional special relativity. And so you can derive the, the, you know, the Lorentz transform by effectively embedding uh, 
by doing a layered digraph embedding of the causal network into a into a Minkowski lattice, and then considering different updating orders to be different collections of of space-like separated updating events. But that's that was only there as a kind of a, a pedagogical aid to show that you can still recover the conventional Lorentz transform from that. You know, the, the fundamental idea is special relativity is just causal invariance at, at, at some level. I think you need to have one of those QED you know, uh, <laughs> rectangle black blobs at the end of the, the initial derivation before you get into this ex this example mapping. Um, right, right. But I mean, the issue is that it's kind of, it's so, once you realize that, the derivation is really elementary, right? It's just, you just say, you're saying, yes. you know, causal That was graphs why I could do it 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But it seemed a little bit hollow. It seemed like sleight of hand. So I wanted to show how that was actually equivalent to the sort of more traditional derivations of the rest. Seems case. like a small UI, UI change is needed in your paper. Um, <laughs> yes, but, seems so. The, um, let me, we're going to run out of time here. Um, and we are going to be uh, going into a working session actually about quantum mechanics at the top of the hour. Um, so let me try and take some of the uh, questions that are coming in here. So from and such stroke if space if time and space are discrete why do you want to calculus with fractional dimensions okay that one is fairly easy to answer um, because we want to understand i mean if space and time are discrete but the elementary length is 10 to the minus 93 meters for all practical purposes the things we will see that we are able to experience will seem kind of continuous to us and also there is a decent chance that you can kind of, you know, what the goal is to get enough computational reducibility that you can make global conclusions about things without having to get into the into the knitting, into the weeds of, you know, exactly which graph update did exactly which thing. So the hope is that there's sort of a, a, a higher level theory that could be based on more like continuous mathematics. And that's part of why what we're doing dovetails so nicely with sort of existing mathematical physics that you know, there's great interest in seeing the sort of higher level continuum description, even though at the lowest level, one is one is sort of foundation, the foundation is discrete. I mean, it, it's similar to what one does in fluid dynamics. There's, you know, at, one knows that fluids are made of molecules, yet it is useful to have a continuum description for many purposes, although it is also useful to be able to fall back on a discrete description. So like one of the things we were talking about just yesterday in connection with black holes and singularities and space time was in the Einstein equations, there's this really confusing, I mean, the whole business about how uh, Schwarzschild black holes work in the Einstein equations, it's a collapsed star, but actually the metric that the Einstein equations have, uh, the standard metric for black holes is a vacuum metric, which means, well, it came from a collapsed star, but there doesn't need to be a star inside. But there isn't a star inside, but there is this point at the center that is sort of cut out of space time that is not part of space time because, uh, and, and you know, there's a more complicated topology to space time around there. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complicated thing. And we end up in, in traditional general relativity, there's a lot of kind of dancing around um, that, that issue. We don't get to do that kind of dancing around because we think we have an underlying theory that should just be true. And all of the things that come out in general relativity have to be some continuum limit of that. But we'll see through the continuum limit to something lower level in these extreme cases. And I think that the, uh, you know, that, that's, that's sort of the interesting thing. There is a foundation, there's a, there's a solid foundation. And then we want to look at the places where we can kind of jump ahead by getting continuum limits in the kind of way that calculus has done. Um, and I, I think they're going to be things which are sort of uh, things where one can make a global statement about how things work in the early universe and things like that on the basis of things like fractional dimensional calculus, um, and, uh, but we don't yet know how to do it. Um, there's a question here about promo codes for the Wolfram Summer School. Yeah, it, it's, it's, I mean, we uh, usually there's, uh, we, we don't, um, um, we traditionally have never charged tuition, so to speak. Um, it's always just been uh, a question of um, uh, the fact that people physically come to Boston for three weeks. Um, this year, I, I think we have a, a modest fee, which is gonna cover a bunch of technology stuff and, and people and so on. Um, but uh, uh, we're absolutely um, uh, making available financial aid and scholarships and things. So please don't, uh, not apply for, for financial reasons. Um, okay, there's a question here. Um, the, 
um, what's my opinion of uh, Gerhard, at, yeah, he's now rethinking, Gerard, sorry. Um, Gerard at Hoft's uh, Cellular Automata Interpretation of Quantum Mechanics. He and I have talked about this a bunch of times and I admit that I haven't understood it very well. Um, I think that, um, and uh, I think that would be the fairest thing to say. And, and you know, when I sent uh, Gerard, you know, stuff on this project, he responded with a long essay about cellular automaton quantum mechanics, which I admit that I have not yet really processed. So I, I, I don't know is the answer. I, you know, my impression is that, um, actually it was kind of funny because he wrote to me and he said, he just sent in a tech support request about Mathematica. And then he gets this mail from me about something completely different. And his first thing in, in seeing the mail was, it's nice that the boss is responding to the tech support request, but it wasn't, it wasn't so. Um, the, uh, um, but anyway, the, the um, uh, look, I, I really don't have anything sensible to say because I really don't know. Um, I mean, it is my impression that, no, I, I just shouldn't say, because I, I, I mean, Jonathan, do you have anything useful to say? I, I um, No, I, I'm in your, I'm in the same position. I haven't understood it well enough to say anything sensible. I think it's one of these, let's, let's, let's get him on one of these live streams and let's interview him about it. And then maybe we'll understand it better. Um, and we might understand some relationship that it has to, to what we're currently doing. Um, Okay, there's a question here. Do you have plans for some live stream or other masterclass sessions on computational physics problem solving? Um, I think that's a come to the summer school story. That's our, that's our kind of um, uh, place for that. Uh, question about writing good code. I think that's gonna take us too long to cover right here. Um, okay, it's a question from Chow. Um, is there a way to programmatically identify and classify which rules would generate hypergraphs with three-dimensional characteristics or other characteristics for the model to generate a recognizable universe? Yeah, that's one of the big challenges. I mean, in, in, in the work that I did uh, writing that technical introduction, I did a lot of filterings of large numbers of rules looking for particular attributes, for example, causal invariance, for example, formation of manifolds and so on. Um, the answer is yes, there are a bunch of kinds of filters that you can use to try to identify uh, sort of things that you, um, um, uh, things that, that um, uh, you think are desirable for, for modeling physics. I think one of the challenges I, you know, my, my silly statement is the computational animals are always smarter than you are, um, means that, you know, you think you've got a filter that's gonna, you know, going to capture all these things correctly, but something is just does something a little bit unexpected and it escapes. Um, so let me mention something along those lines. You know, in general relativity, for example, we know certain configurations of the gravitational field that make things like black holes. A thing that I was just thinking about yesterday, actually. Um, the, uh, uh, we don't know what kinds of, the certain kinds of, you know, black holes represent some sort of topological uh, uh, puncturing of standard space time. And they, they represent, uh, sort of a thing you can get where we understand you can get them because you know Schwarzschild discovered that solution in 1916, although it took a long time to understand it clearly. But we don't really know what weird potentially macroscopic configurations might exist in things like the gravitational field, which might have as their core some complicated topological structure, just as, for example, some of these existing ones just have a, a point, a line removed from space time and so on. And so the really, the, the, the fun thing to think about is, um, okay, so you wanna do the science fiction version of this, you wanna know, people ask, okay, to, so does your theory support faster than light travel? Okay, and the answer is, I don't know. And so the question is, could there be, and this is a, a word I just invented a day ago, uh, space tunnels, that is places where, uh, you know, you can, places where in, in the hypergraph, for example, you can sort of get from one part of space to another through some kind of tunnel, a little bit like a wormhole, but maybe a different in character from a wormhole, and maybe something that doesn't have a good continuum limit in um, where, where there are sort of a core to what's going on that isn't, doesn't have the same kind of uh, uh, mathematical structure 
that things like black holes have. So that's a, a thing to think about. And um, uh, I don't know where I was getting to that from. Um, yeah, that, that's sort of a, a uh, you know, it's hard to expect the unexpected, so to speak. That yes, we can look for manifolds, we can look for things like this, which we expect. But if there's something absolutely bizarre and unexpected, um, you know, there's a tremendous habit of missing it if you get the wrong filters. Um, let's see. Uh, um, there's a quick question here from Finn. Is it possible to simulate a universe in terms of particles and forces by using this model? Uh, well, ultimately, yes. I mean, I've been surprised. I thought we were going to have to identify how particles worked in order to even understand things like energy. It's been a big surprise to me that we can get sort of a bulk understanding of things like energy, uh, angular momentum, we'll see about charge, without having to say, oh, there's a particle that's involved in this. So I don't know how far that's going to go. But I, in fact, in the next um, thing that we're supposed to be starting in a few minutes here, we'll be going to be talking about quantum mechanics. And a lot of the, the sort of thought experiments or actual experiments with quantum mechanics are done in terms of particles. And there's a question of to what extent we can sort of get bulk versions of those results. Um, the, uh, let's see. Um, okay, there's a question from Brian here. When will a glossary of terms that we're using, for example, in these live streams be published on the website? You know what, better happen by the end of this weekend because uh, we have a draft of part of that and we just need to finish it. Um, thank you for the reminder. Um, let's see. There's a question here about the relationship between electromagnetism and 3D space. Um, uh, good question. I mean, I don't know to what extent the structure of a local gauge group like uh, electromagnetism will be related. You know, is the U1 gauge group of electromagnetism have anything to do with um, uh, sort of the structure of space time? Uh, quite possibly, but we don't really know yet. Um, let's see. Question here. Um, let me take one or two more here and then we should wrap up. And uh, I invite people to join us for our uh, attempt to reproduce some of the sort of classic phenomena of quantum mechanics through our, through our models that's coming up next. Um, the, uh, let's see, there's a question here. Is it possible to have a quantitative measure of the increase of knowledge in science when moving from one scientific model to a better scientific model? That's an interesting question. You know, in, in this thing we're calling rule real space, this, this sort of multi-way system of all possible rules, we actually, that actually uh, is, a, is a surprisingly and bizarrely quantitative way of thinking about these things where you have different description languages, different, um, uh, you know, where your reference frames are different description languages, and where one can ask questions like, uh, you know, to what extent does this description language succeed in getting further, faster, and so on? Um, so we might have some strangely quantitative things to say about that. You know, the qualitative level um, of, uh, you know, how do better models allow you to get further? That's a complicated thing in the history of science because often the new model allows you to get some things faster, but existing things maybe even slower. I mean, this is what happened in the you know, transition from Ptolemy to Copernicus. You know, Copernicus's work didn't let you compute positions of planets any better than Ptolemy. In the end, it, you know, was able to do a lot more things and able to help one understand a lot more things. But at the beginning, the kind of meat and potatoes of, of the existing uh, work in astronomy uh, wasn't improved by that. And so that's, a, that's an interesting thing. And, and I think in our case, one of the things that's really kind of exciting is that there are questions like how to do numerical relativity or how to do numerical quantum field theory, which it looks like our theory um, has, has ways to contribute to. In other words, it has ways to contribute just to the practice of what's already been done in addition to providing new foundations. So that's, that's really uh, an interesting thing to me. Um, there's a question, what will be the main impact of this theory in, in regard to how physics is done and the understanding of metaphysics? You know, I think, uh, this how physics is done, it's like you tell your average biologist, we just figured out the origin of life. And the average biologist rightly doesn't care because the average biologist is working on things about life as it exists and this and that and, uh, you know, biochemistry and molecular biology, whatever else, um, you know, and it just doesn't matter. 
what the origin of life on Earth was. And so similarly for physics, you know, knowing at a, a scale of 10 to the minus 93 meters what space-time is like is not relevant if what you're studying is, you know, the mechanics of the flow of sand or something. Um, it's, it's uh, uh, you know, from a, from a purely practical point of view, that doesn't really, um, uh, you know, that, that's not going to make a difference. From a metaphysical, from a sort of conceptual philosophical point of view, I think there is a very important implication, which is it really is computation all the way down. And, you know, the idea that, that one sort of has to, and, and so the intuition that comes from computation becomes intuition that's worth having throughout physics. Computation is not just a thing as an aid to mathematics, for example. It's something that fundamentally is how it works. The mathematics is just something that is coming to the aid of computation. I think that changes one's sort of, in a sense, metaphysical view of physics um, and has a bunch of consequences in terms of the expectation of computational irreducibility and undecidability and things like that being important in physics. And, uh, uh, you know, so th I think those will, be, those will be significant things. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think we, we need to move to our other, um, uh, to our other live stream here. Um, and, uh, it's questions about how do you justify the length scale? So many orders of magnitude below the Planck scale. Um, I tried to write about that. It's not how I expected it would come out, but it is, it is what seems to be happening there. And it really has to do with the fact that there's this multi-way graph that represents the space of all quantum possibilities and that that's another scale that comes in beyond the mere uh, dimensional analysis scale of um, uh, the um, uh, of um, uh, of the uh, gravitational constant and so on. All right, I think um, I think we have to wrap up here. But I really do invite people to join us on our uh, working session coming up in just a few minutes here. Um, that. Um, um, where we'll be talking about quantum mechanics. And I hope I will have a chance to do another one of these Q and A's um, uh, in, uh, in another future week. And actually tomorrow, I'm looking at my calendar here, tomorrow I have a very different Q and A that I've been doing as uh, a fun public service uh, during these pandemic times for kids, 2.30 uh, uh, Eastern time, uh, Q&A about science with a focus on how things work. There'll be different focus is going forward in different weeks. This one I've been, um, I've been told I, people enjoy my how things work descriptions, so we're going to focus on the how things work question. So coming next here, working session on not really how things work, on or we hope on how things work in some of the uh, um, uh, sort of elementary phenomena of quantum mechanics. All right. Thanks a lot. Hope to see you all um, in our next live stream. Okay, bye for now.